All right, now I'm going to continue with talking about thermochemistry, and we're going to get a little bit more mathematical now. So we have a general idea of how thermochemistry works. We're talking about the flow of energy, the flow of heat transfer um, from a reaction to the surroundings or from the surroundings to the reaction. Now we have to put some actual math to this. So the first thing we have to talk about, of course, is then the units of energy. So more old school units are calories. So lowercase c, I'm going to talk about why that's important in a second, but lowercase c is a calorie. And a calorie is a unit of energy, and it is the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So that really is an interesting energy unit if you think about it. It's kind of standardized to water, and it's standardized to our Celsius scale. So one calorie is the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. That's what a calorie is. That's a unit of energy. Okay, you might be more familiar with what's known as a kilocalorie. This is used in common everyday um, language all the time. One kilocalorie is equal to a thousand lowercase c calories. But that 1,000 lowercase c calories, one kilocalorie, is also known as a capital C calorie. That's the one that is used in nutrition. So you look at, you know, an M&M pack, pack of M&Ms or a Snickers bar or something like that, and it tells you that it's 150 capital C calories. That means that it is 150,000 lowercase c calories. Um, and they just do that so that we don't have these huge numbers on our, our packaging of food. So capital C calories, when we use them in nutrition, show us how much energy is available to us from the food that we eat. So again, most of the time I'm going to be talking about lowercase c calories. When you talk about calories used in nutrition, that's a capital C calorie. It's a thousand lowercase c calories. Now again, calories are a little bit more of an old school unit. Um, they're still used. My PhD advisor always thought about things in terms of calories. Um, but there's been a movement in chemistry to move more towards joules. So this is the one that I'm going to uh, try to continue to use with you guys, although sometimes I slip up and fall back into calories. So we're going to use the unit of joules. One calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. So again, let's think about what the definition of a calorie is. One calorie is the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So 4.184 joules is the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So this is exactly equivalent to a calorie and that energy is still, we can still talk about it the same way. It takes 4.184 joules to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So these are the units that we're going to be using for our energy is joules. Okay, so we're gonna talk about this energy change and talking about it from heat transfer and we're going to be looking at temperature changes. So the heat of the energy, heat of the reaction, the Q of the reaction is proportional to the change in the temperature. So delta always means change in. This particular delta T change in temperature is T final minus T initial. Now this looks very simple and very innocuous, but sometimes it can trip students up. It's not larger minus smaller, okay? That's not what it is. You have to think about and analyze each uh, reaction that you're given, figure out the final temperature of the reaction, and then subtract the initial temperature of the reaction. So if the reaction is exothermic, for example, so exothermic means that energy is lost, heat is lost to the surroundings, then the reaction gets colder. So we're looking at this from the perspective of the reaction. So in this case, the Q of the reaction is going to be cold temperature. Oh, this is proportional to. Hold on a second, let me fix that. That's all kinds of bad here. It is 
proportional to the delta t, the delta t in this case, t final, it's cold, minus t initial, it was warmer. So just sort of throwing some values in here, the t final for this might be 15 degrees Celsius minus 35 degrees Celsius. Again, from the perspective of the reaction, the reaction lost energy to the surrounding, so its final temperature is cold, its initial temperature was warmer. So in this case, the delta T will be a negative value. However, if the reaction is endothermic, then heat is gained from the surroundings and the reaction gets hotter. So in this case, the Q of the reaction is proportional to the delta T that the reaction experiences. The delta T that the reaction experiences is that it is endothermic and heat is required. So the reaction gets hotter. So the final temperature is going to be warm of the reaction. The initial temperature is going to be colder. So delta T for this then will be, you know, if we plug in some values, the delta T for this reaction will be positive. So you again, signs are the most important thing for thermochemistry. You have to watch your signs, make sure you know what your signs are. So you have to watch your signs for delta T. It's T final minus T initial, not like big T minus small t, T final minus T initial, and it can change based on if you're talking about the reaction or the surroundings. So here is your equation, Q equals MC delta T. Let's define which each one of these variables are and then figure out what their units will be in. Q is the heat transfer. It's our energy term. M is mass. C is a, is a constant. It's material dependent. This is called the specific heat capacity. It has units of joules per gram degree Kelvin. Delta T is the change in temperature like we just discussed. and it's T final minus T initial. So let's go through and figure out what the units on everything must be. Look to your constant to tell you what the units of each one should be. So Q is our heat term. It's gonna be given to us in terms of joules. Mass must be in terms of grams. Change in temperature must be in Kelvin. So let's talk a little bit more about that specific heat capacity. Like I said, it is material specific. It's the amount of energy required to raise one gram of any material now by one degree Celsius. So we already know what it is for water. I told you that the specific heat capacity basically of water was one calorie because that's the definition. The amount of energy required to raise one gram of any material by one degree Celsius. We're gonna use it in, in joules more, so that's that 4.184 joules per gram Kelvin. The specific heat capacity of iron is 0.45 joules per gram degree Kelvin. The specific heat capacity of glass is 0.84 joules per gram degree Kelvin. Now this is where I would talk to you a little bit about, let's understand what the specific heat capacity is. Water has a high specific heat capacity. It takes 4.184 joules to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Iron, on the other hand, has a lower, much lower specific heat capacity. It takes 0.45 joules to raise one gram of iron by one degree Celsius, or Kelvin rather. So then the question is, which material resists heat change? more. So think about that for a second. Water or iron 
which one is going to resist heat change. Basically, which one is it going to take more and more and more energy before the material actually changes temperature? The answer to that is water. Water has a higher heat capacity. It takes more energy to change its temperature. This is really what water is a very unique um, material uh, for many reasons, but one of those is a specific heat capacity is very, very high. This is why we use water uh, to cool different um, um, electronics. There are some fancy electronics that are water cooled. Also nuclear reactors are water cooled because they produce so much energy um, that energy has to go somewhere. And so they uh, put water jackets around these things. And so the energy flows into the water and it takes a lot of energy before you start to boil that water. And so water resists heat change because it has a high specific heat capacity. Metals and things like that, on the other hand, change temperature very quickly. It takes only a little bit of energy to change the temperature of iron compared to changing the temperature of water.